All right, uh, thank you. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, sorry, I don't I have my slides aren't showing up here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today basically is, as the title says, uh, where beta cells come from, how we're going to make beta cells uh, to treat people with, uh, with diabetes. So the, the beta cell um, is a cell that, the only cell really in your body that makes insulin, the insulin that you need to control your blood sugar as well as uh, uh, other nutrients in your, um, in your blood supply. And uh, the beta cells are only found in the pancreas in the islets of Langerhans. Uh, we each have approximately a million islets of Langerhans, each of which has about a thousand beta cells. So you have roughly a billion beta cells. Sounds like a lot, um, but it's less than the, the tip of my little finger is all the beta cells that you have. Those are critical to controlling your blood sugar. And of course, if you lose those beta cells, then you have to control your blood sugar with insulin. So the, the loss of, of beta cells, as we've already heard from the earlier speakers, um, is the cause of type 1 diabetes. People with type 1 diabetes have had their beta cells destroyed by the immune system and therefore have to take insulin to replace the insulin the beta cells would normally make. This is an absolute deficiency of insulin. People with type 2 diabetes, um, on the other hand, have a relative deficiency of insulin. They need more insulin and generally can make less, um, and as a result, supply doesn't meet demand and their blood sugar goes up. But in fact, for most people with type 2 diabetes, they actually have a deficiency of beta cells as well. They have some beta cells, but they don't have enough beta cells. So for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, the underlying problem is the beta cell, which means that if you're going to cure diabetes, um, you have to replace the beta cell. So beta cell replacement is really the only way that we know of to cure type 1 diabetes in most people with type 2 diabetes. So where will those beta cells come from? Well, currently, we really have uh, only one way that we know of of making beta cells. And that's the way that, that you all made your own beta cells. The process that occurs when you're a fetus inside your mother and you developed all your organs, including the islets of Langerhans and the beta cells inside the islets of Langerhans. So understanding that process and learning how to control that process um, is the only way to eventually produce new beta cells for people with diabetes. So how does that normally work? Well, the pancreas forms from the gut. The, the gut tube forms uh, as, a, as a layer of cells called the endoderm that then uh, uh, essentially curls up into a tube and forms the gut. I'm sorry, we, we seem to be going the wrong direction here. Can we go back? Yes, as, as a tube um, in which uh, a variety of then uh, organs uh, come off of that, including the liver and the lungs, but in particular the pancreas. It starts initially as just a little cluster of cells on the side of the gut tube, which then grows into the entire pancreatic organ. So that process by which you start out with a few undifferentiated cells, cells that have potential to become different kinds of things, grows, then grow into the entire pancreas, and in the different kinds of cells in the pancreas, that process called differentiation is critical to understand in order to understand how to make a beta cell. So um, how does that happen? Those gut endoderm cells, as they begin to form that cluster on the, on the side of the gut, um, uh, develop into what we call the primary pancreatic progenitors. Those are the cells from which all the pancreatic cells will eventually develop. Right away, as soon as that cluster of cells starts to grow, in addition to growing and making more pancreatic progenitors, you also start to make um, some of the, uh, um, uh, the endocrine cells, the cells that make hormones. This happens almost as soon as you start to grow a pancreas, you start to make endocrine cells that make hormones, including insulin. However, these early insulin-producing cells don't have the features of a true beta cell. In particular, they can't actually sense what the glucose levels are. So as a result, um, these cells simply secrete insulin in an uncontrolled fashion. They're very important for the growth of the embryo. The embryo needs those in order to be able to utilize nutrients and store nutrients. But the blood sugar in the embryo is actually controlled by the mother. So these, these cells, these ins early insulin-producing cells, don't need to and aren't capable of sensing what the blood sugar is. 
It takes a little bit longer in the production of what we call the secondary uh, pancreatic progenitors before you start to get really the mature islet cells, including the beta cells um, that you'll need as an adult. This, the beta cells are able to sense glucose and respond and secrete insulin in a controlled fashion. So those are the cells that we really need, and so that's the process that we really need to understand. Around the, time of, around the same time, you actually make the other cell types of the pancreas, uh, including the, uh, um, the, the duct cells and the acinar cells. The acinar cells make the digestive enzymes that make up most of the pancreas. They dump those enzymes into the ducts, which then go to the gut and digest your food. So the islets only make a small fraction of the pancreas, but all of these come from these progenitor cells um, that have the capacity to make different types of cells. Then around the time of birth, that production of new beta cells, um, what we call uh, neogenesis, um, stops. Um, and instead, now you begin to expand your pool of beta cells simply by proliferating the ones that were already there. So this period around the time of birth and about the first year of life is where you really get the large number of beta cells you're going to need as you grow, as you, as you enter adolescence, as you become an adult to control your blood sugar. So this is a process by which you take cells that were already mature, already beta cells, and proliferate them and expand the pool of beta cells. Then, um, as I say, after about a year, uh, maybe a few years of age, that process slows down and almost completely stops um, as you get a, a pool of beta cells that can now control your blood sugar and, and hopefully for many years control your blood sugar. Now that's where we sort of thought things stopped until a few years ago. We sort of thought that, that once you had that pool of beta cells, that was it. That was what you were, you were left with and you better take good care of them. But in fact, we now know that there is the capacity of the, of the um, pancreas in the adult to actually make new beta cells. Part of that process is almost certainly proliferation of pre-existing beta cells, but part of that is also probably this process of neogenesis, just like what happened in the embryo, um, the production of, uh, of new uh, beta cells from other cell types. Now, what cells is it you're making those new beta cells from? Well, there's evidence that you can make those new beta cells um, from the duct cells. Um, there's evidence that you can actually make them from the acinar cells, and even evidence that you can make them from other islet cell types. We don't really know under normal circumstances in an adult human which of these sources really is the primary source for making new beta cells. This is a very active area of research, an important uh, uh, question to answer. There's one other possibility, um, which we, again, don't have any real proof for, and that is, in fact, that there's a, a specialized cell in the pancreas, what we call an adult uh, stem cell, which is, its job in life is actually to generate new differentiated cell types, in particular, new beta cells. The, the, the presence of an adult stem cell is speculated. There's some evidence to support it, but as yet we have not identified an adult stem cell in, in humans, in the pancreas. So the beta cells that you have come essentially from these three pathways. Um, the fetal neogenesis that occurs up to the time of birth, the proliferation which starts around the time of birth and probably extends at least at a low rate um, into adulthood, and adult neogenesis, which we think parallels fetal neogenesis, but we don't really know what the source of the cells for adult neogenesis is. So what I'm going to tell you about in a, just a little bit more detail, because these are the things we know more about, is uh, how fetal neogenesis works and how proliferation of beta cells works. Fetal neogenesis and understanding fetal neogenesis is particularly important because we think this is the pathway by which we're going to be able to make new beta cells from embryonic stem cells. And in fact, we already have evidence that we can do this. So to do this, to control this process of getting um, a progenitor cell, in particular an embryonic stem cell, to move all the way to a mature beta cell, is really a matter of controlling the process of decisions that cell makes as it matures. There's a lot of options. A lot of different cell types that an uh, a, uh, embryonic stem cell can become, and it goes through a number of steps to get to one particular cell type. 
What you want to do is control each of the decisions along that way. It's as if uh, you wanted to drive from San Diego um, to New York and you have a GPS device in your car that instructs you and it tells you each time you come to an intersection which way to turn. In fact, you may have absolutely no idea where New York is, but as long as that GPS device tells you every time you come to an intersection which way to go, you will end up in New York. That's what we want to do with embryonic stem cells is that each of those decision points, which hopefully are not quite as many as the intersections between here and New York, um, at each of those decision points, we direct the cells which way to go. And in order to do that, we've spent a lot of time understanding how each of those decision points is controlled and what are the genes that control those decision points. Sorry. Um, so if you look in particular at the late part where we decide which the different cell types that are going to form the pancreas are, um, we've identified many of the genes in fact, we think probably the majority of the genes that really control this process and each of these decisions along the way, that direct them to go in the right direction, to mature to the next step, um, and finally to make the beta cell, which has this wonderful capacity to sense um, uh, glucose and uh, secrete insulin in a controlled fashion. Um, uh, ultimately, um, this process uh, is, in fact, the process we're going to use uh, to make uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, make embryonic stem cells turn into beta cells. The, the, um, one of the remarkable things about this pathway and the genes that control this pathway is as we've learned about the genes that make up this pathway, what we have found out is that many of the genes in this pathway are actually mutated in people with diabetes. And in fact, this pathway, along with genes that are involved in controlling the, uh, the immune system, are the major places that we see, see things breaking down in people with diabetes. Um, in type 1 diabetes, many of the genes are in the immune system. In type 2 diabetes, many of the genes are in this pathway that cause diabetes. Um, and so we know that in humans, the formation of beta cells follows exactly this pathway, requires these genes, and if we want to make new beta cells, we better understand how this process works. All right. So how far have we come in getting cells to move down this pathway um, in getting uh, embryonic stem cells to mature into, um, into uh, uh, mature glucose-sensing beta cells? Well, actually, a company right here in the San Diego area um, was the first to get human embryonic stem cells um, to mature into um, uh, endoderm this uh, sheet of cells that makes up the gut and ultimately the pancreas. That turned out to be actually a very difficult step. It's the first step in this process, but it turned out to be a tough one. And, and very quickly after that, they and others were able to get to move, things to move further down the pathway. In fact, eventually to make insulin-producing cells. Um, however, there's a small problem with this. As you can see, the staining here for insulin in the bottom picture here, insulin cells are red, cells that make the hormone glucagon are green, and then you'll see that many of the cells in here are actually orange or yellow, which means it's actually making both hormones. This is a characteristic of those early endocrine cells. And in fact, what we think is going on is that uh, instead of going down and making mature islet cells, We've been very successful at getting cells to the primary pancreatic progenitors and making primary endocrine cells. And so getting them to move, in fact, to secondary pancreatic progenitors and make normal islet cells is a big focus of the field right now, an important area of research that hopefully we can actually get um, uh, normal adult beta cells made in a culture dish. So the second pathway I want to talk about is the things that control proliferation of the beta cell. Um, it's remarkable that the beta cell is essentially a node in a vast information network in, inside your body and gets information from many sources that tells the beta cell how much insulin it needs to produce, how much it needs to secrete right now, in fact, how much it's going to need to secrete in the future and therefore whether it needs to expand the pool of beta cells or contract the pool of beta cells. And as it shows up here, these come from many sources, these, this information. But in particular, I'm going to talk about the pituitary and the placenta, which control the beta cell numbers during pregnancy. During pregnancy in women, um, they expand their beta cell pool about twofold. And so understanding how that works 
It's really important to uh, understanding how beta cell proliferation is controlled and potentially how we can control it. So during pregnancy, the placenta makes a hormone called placental lactogen and induces a protein, a receptor on the surface of the beta cell called the prolactin receptor, which then in turn sends a signal to the nucleus to make an enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase, which then takes tryptophan, which comes from your diet, and turns it into 5-HT or serotonin. Serotonin then gets secreted by the beta cell in response to the meal, response to glucose, binds to another receptor on the surface of the beta cell, which then drives the proliferation of the beta cell during pregnancy. Then right at the end of pregnancy, the receptor on the surface of the beta cell switches to an inhibitory receptor, then you shut off proliferation of the beta cell, and that beta cell pool contracts back down to the normal size within a few weeks after pregnancy. This is an, an incredibly complicated system, it seems like. As biologists, we like to believe that things will be simple. Um, but in fact, this is kind of a Rue, Rue Goldberg kind of setup. Why would you have this? There's really multiple areas in where it, both it can go wrong, um, where the uh, um, system is under different types of control. Um, all these various steps um, uh, seem like an a, a unnecessary complication, just a, a setup for things to go wrong. But in fact, I believe that the reason that it evolved this way is in fact so the, the mother's production of, of insulin and its, the mother's capacity to produce insulin is, in, is uh, um, equal to the demand. So the diet in particular, um, the diet in the forms of amino acids like tryptophan, in the form of glucose, controls the production of serotonin, the secretion of, production of serotonin, and the um, proliferation of the beta cells. So information from these various sources then um, integrates to control the beta cell. And understanding that process is going to be critical to understanding how beta cells are made and eventually um, to driving that process um, and expanding beta cells in patients with type 1 diabetes. So finally, I just want to recognize the people in my lab and the funding sources that helped us do this work. Thank you very much.